Hey, Theron here, and I'm proud to announce that we are now testing all out the uh, Iron Mountain Armory uh, Tose Gusoku uh, armor, and to today we're going to be testing the full uh, Gosoku, the suit, uh, the doll, and the uh, Kabuto, uh, the Hachi on the Kabuto. What I've done is I've set up a test based on each time period. Uh, or say era in history that a lot of people wanted to see and some of these cross over into more modern warriors uh, such I have a shillelagh here the shillelagh is made out of mesquite and it's going to represent any type of club that this armor could come in contact with but we're starting in the Neolithic era or uh, early man so to speak where they had uh, uh, flint napped uh, weapons as you see here and I even have an obsidian uh, spearhead and arrowhead as well to test on this armor on the actual dull, because uh, I think that the spearheads have the greatest chance of penetrating it. I know that the conquistadors supposedly had very little trouble with the arrows and acolytals and stuff of the Aztecs, uh, but we're gonna see what happens on Iron Mountain Armory's armor. It is a lighter armor than that. Now, that is a Nambin Do uh, Tose Gosoko, and yes, they did that. They used European armor, or armor from the uh, uh, Western barbarians, uh, and modified it. So what they would do is they would d deck it out as uh, samurai armor around the 16th century. And this is 16th century armor, but this is a lighter version. This is a version like you'd be running around to scale a castle wall with, not necessarily trying to stop for sure a, a uh, musket or a, uh, an actual match lock at the time. Uh, so what we're going to do today is we're going to test it against uh, a club for sure, which could be an arerbo, which an arerbo is a uh, one-handed cannibal. Uh, it could represent some of the Native American war clubs, such as the Apache would have used, or uh, the Comanche, or any of the ones that you might have seen on Deadliest Warrior, because that's kind of why we're doing this. We're basing it on different time periods uh, and following different weapon styles that different warriors could have used. These could have been Native American. These could have been early man. Uh, these could have, like I said, the uh, obsidian could be Aztec uh, or Mayan for that point earlier on. Uh, all these weapons that you see here uh, could be weapons from other cultures. This is basically a shillelagh made out of mesquite, which is a common wood that Native Americans used in this area to make war clubs with. So, like I said, Native American war club, uh, uh, maybe a club that one of the uh, Ashigeru might have been using to pound on uh, samurai with. Uh, but anyway, let's get started. Uh, and we're going to start off with the kabuto. And we'll explain how that's set up to make it as scientific as possible. <laughs> This is an important part of the test. Uh, historically, we know that uh, Europeans a lot of times wore arming caps. Uh, we even hear some stories of uh, ancient warriors using their hair as an arming cap. And the uh, chalmage was a uh, the top knot or the uh, actual piece of hair that comes over, much like you see on sumo wrestlers modernly, but now it's a flary hairstyle. But what would happen is wearing it in court and stuff, it would kind of be put in a position like this. And this was actually their hair that came out of their head. But in this situation, it's for battle. This would be pulled over like this, kind of like a mohawk or something pulled across the top of your head. But this provided an enormous amount of padding. Since uh, our Ivar Draugr head here has no uh, hair of his own, we're going to give him his own uh, red uh, chanmagi. Uh, and we're going to take our... Uh, Hachimaki, which is a headband, not like in uh, uh, the Karate Kid, but more like a kendo practitioner would wear. This is a bit uh, light cloth, lighter than they would use, but I'm going to put this over the actual head and try to get it on here properly. And this is going to come back and secure our Chanmagi and help protect his head from damage. This is a very important part of our testing because the helm has a cloth liner like most historical helms do and helps hold the helm from your head like strapping wood. But we know that padding aids tremendously. This head's been tested, I'm not gonna lie, with another weapon, uh, the bog axe, and through another helmet. It actually cut through that helmet and into the head. So hopefully this is gonna give him lots of protection. Uh, and we're gonna start off with a very brutal weapon. We have our hachi here, or our dome. Uh, we have our minpo. Uh, Minpo Yorari means uh, face armor. We have our uh, Hana, Hana, our Kari, our uh, Shikiro, our 
Fujigachi Mon here and our Fujigachi. So we have the whole helmet uh, and let's go ahead and see what happens. I'm not going to exploit certain things. I'm not going to try to hit up under because there'd be a shoulder here. And it'd be very difficult to do that. So we're not going to go for niches. Plus there's other pieces of armor. Uh, Kikogani could have gone underneath it and you would have a Bourget type thing that came up around the neck anyway, which is a form of uh, Lamellar. We're going to start in the Neolithic era, uh, which is all early warriors and tribal people uh, that might have still used what some people consider primitive weapons, but they were the most efficient weapons at the time uh, that were easily accessible and made. This is a shillelagh, uh, you might recognize it because I used it in a special for St. Patrick's Day, and it was devastating to the head we hit. Me and Marquez destroyed one of these analog bills of shell heads, and uh, after seeing that, it's hard to picture something protecting you from such an impact. Uh, this is made out of mesquite. I know a lot of the original ones are made of black thorn. Uh, a lot of them are made out of root wood. A lot of Native American war clubs, which this could represent as well, were made out of root wood because it did not break easily. It was less likely to split. Uh, this one's made out of mesquite. Mesquite is not going to split. It's an excellent wood in this area. Matter of fact, some Native Americans used it to make their war clubs. But this could also represent a Japanese weapon. I know that the uh, Rerobo, which is akin to the Cannibal, uh, which normally had iron spikes on it or studs, uh, was a mace. So it's an actual uh, composite club. This is not composite. Some of the uh, Native American clubs are composite because they had little protrusions or bone or metal spikes. This one itself is actually uh, just wood, but the shape makes it devastating because of the actual uh, fork in the wood where I cut it out. Uh, I think it's an excellent weapon, but we're going to start off with this one, and this could kind of represent anybody. The Aztecs, the, uh, uh, some of the early uh, tribal groups like the Nari, uh, they used weapons made out of wood, and some of them were more uh, composite. This one's not. Let's go ahead and see what it does today to our helm, or our kabuto. Go ahead and take a good hit at it uh, and see what it does, just like we did in the original video. Nice impact. Uh, we have a dent. Let's see how bad he's in. Now this dent looks really bad. The uh, paint that they use, uh, because it's safer for the environment, is a lot like a car paint, uh, actually flaked. So that made the almost look like it had a hole in it. My heart almost stopped. I thought, wow, I can't believe this club I know is devastating. And yes, any club or mace is devastating historically, whether it actually has metal on it or not. This has a very hefty weight. It's able to destroy a head in one hit. So let's see what happened inside here. It does look pretty bad, but we also know how high this is up on the head. And with the chavangi and the uh, cloth, uh, I have a feeling, and uh, the actually method that they used to keep it away from the head with the cloth liner might be okay. Because so you can see that's way up on the head. The dent doesn't quite reach the head, I don't think, but it might have hit it. it might have hit it. Let's go ahead and uh, take off our for menpo, his nose. Our, uh, min yorari. And luckily his Peso. nose has no bone, so it might come off with the face. Oh, the nose, Yahweh, yeah, it can get damaged. It's been damaged. This is an older uh, test head, but I didn't want to waste it, and I figured it would work fine for this. Okay. Uh, take the chumangi. Actually, he'd just flip it back, but in our case, we're going to have to do this. This was already here. Let's get a good look at it. It was already here, and this damage was already here from a helm scraping his forehead. It has nothing to do with our helm. Yes. We hear, but I, I can't tell for sure. I don't think he actually got any kind of head injury from it, other than maybe a bruise. He might have, might have been knocked silly. He could have shook it off, possibly. We want to be as scientific as possible uh, and fair. Uh, so what I've done is I've got the dough uh, right here on our mannequin. Some of you might recognize Lola or Valkyria or uh, Valkyrie. Uh, it's a mannequin. Uh, it is a female mannequin, but we've got it set up in such a way this time where the gel protrudes more. Uh, we've actually got it where the gel cannot move around inside and get damaged just by the actual shell of the mannequin. Uh, and on top of that, we have proper clothing under it. We have our uh, Hakama and then we have our Kimono on top. But to further add to this, what we've done is a lot of times there would be a silk uh, obi that wrapped around the body, much like the Sarashi. 
underneath the armor. So this mannequin actually has that over the uh, kimono. It's wrapped around and around, kind of acting like Gambeson in a way. It helps reinforce areas where the dull might make contact with the body at the bottom. Because you see, it's domed to keep it away from the chest. In case something were to slightly pierce it, it won't injure you. But over our analog ballistics gel that's in here, or jelly belly as I could like to call it, uh, which is a, a hardcore gel, uh, probably about 20% gel, uh, it should give us an accurate uh, account if something does go through, if it actually wounded or injured our uh, samurai. Much better uh, than the one we did our debunking video on where they had just a straw or a stuffed uh, sand mannequin or something that was very ragdoll-like. Uh, it is tied. I'm not using a proper sarashi on the outside. I'm using one that's more of a show one. I'm hopefully I don't hit it, but I've got it to help secure it to our post. It can give and move. This is not solid, as most people would think, you know, something solid, you know, you just put up against a tree and try to shoot uh, arrows into it or, or thrust it. Uh, no, this gives, and it could possibly get knocked loose, but I doubt it with it tied. Uh, hopefully, uh, our uh, samurai today holds up well, and we're going to mostly focus on this area right here. This is where the actual ballistics gel is in this area. Uh, and we're going to see what happens in, in the uh, dull, uh, dull area here. Uh, we might do a little testing on some of the other stuff, but this is a mannequin, so these are not proper analogs. So the main focus is to test the metal itself, the steel from Iron Mountain Armory, and see if it can hold up to all the weapons that we will be testing today. Look around here. No, no. Uh, just kidding there guys but uh, i'd like to thank uh Waylon for providing you with the coyote hides i thought it was really nice to look like some kind of uh, old shaman or something from the neolithic era possibly if they did dress exactly like this we know they wore hides a lot uh, but i have a neolithic head here uh, it is stone but it's very much like a native american would use as well like the apache or the comanche or any of the tribes uh, and they use these uh even in the old west against firearms uh, when they're short on steel. They knew how to nap stone, they knew how to nap flint and shirt. Uh, we're going to try this first against the Japanese armor, and it's very plausible uh, that they could have encountered something like this because they did go to different islands and stuff when they would have encountered islanders. They even went to the Philippines later on. So, what we're going to do right now is uh, shoot the arrow uh, into the armor and see what it does. I'm thinking it's going to break. Uh, if it does get any kind of penetration at all, I think it's going to shatter upon impact. Uh, but I'm not sure. We're not sure what it'll do. Uh, the arrow's a bit sharp. This is a powerful bow, so we'll get a little bit less poundage than the uh, 65, 70 pounds. We'll probably get around 50 or so, but that's fine because that's what we want. We want about a hunting bow strength and see what this does to start off with this arrow. Ooh. I don't know what I hit, but that wasn't good. I think you missed. Uh, yeah. So sharp arrow. Oh! Well, that's what happens when you hit something that stops the arrow instantly. We've got a scratch. I meant to hit a little bit lower, but I hit a bit high. But I still think this shows that the Iron Mountain Armory uh, dole is very protective. It put but a scratch. I don't even know if it scratched the metal. Maybe a little bit. But the arrow exploded. Kind of what I expected, but worse than what I expected. The arrow's in pieces. I expected pieces. the head to burst, not the whole thing. But let's see what the head did. Head uh, it shattered. We could try the obsidian and see what that does. I mean, that's what the Aztecs used, and that's what a lot of uh, Islander cultures used. Was, uh, they swore by it. It was sharp, razor sharp. So let's see what it does. The obsidian tip, uh, see what it does. Uh, it is probably more brittle than the chert or the flint. Uh, it should be sharper though. I don't think that's going to make a big difference. Although when we inspected that closely, we realized that not only did the point hit and put a little dimple in the metal, not much, it shattered and hit it again, and then the arrow exploded into three pieces or, or more, like into smithereens. Can't wait to see that in slow-mo later. But let's go ahead and uh, try this arrow real quick and see what it does. Oh, technically, the only chance these cultures would probably have if someone was wearing armor like that is to hit in a niche. And we're purposely not aiming for those areas because from Iron Mountain Armory, you can get the Kikogani, 
which is a form of uh, brigadine that goes under the arms. So theoretically, all this stuff could be covered uh, in some way. It's just this is the most basic coverage that you would get from uh, a samurai during the era. shattered our arrow and we hit right over our ballistics gel and it did the same thing. Let's look at these up close. This is amusing. That would have been annoying but this is over our ballistics gel. Our ballistics gel is in this area. But what happened here is it didn't do any real damage but it hits one spot, shatters the arrow and then the second part where the arrow shattered and it forced it deeper into the actual wood, uh, hits again. So you see, you see the dimple here, you can see it clearly here. Bang, where it hit, cracked the stone, and then it hit again here. Pretty interesting, you'd probably get a double tap weird feeling from that, but I don't think it'd be much more than a tickle. Before I forget, I would like to thank Object State Art and Leslie here in Corpus Christi, Texas. Uh, he's the one that provided the obsidian, uh, stone spearhead which this is not it uh, this is one from a medieval shop that we've had for years and we've tested before and it's performed extremely well we've thrown it through rawhide uh boar hide into bottles uh and it went clean through flawlessly and didn't really damage the head at all so i'm thinking this real heavy duty uh spearhead might be more effective on it but we're not sure uh we do have an obsidian one that we received from him the obsidian arrowhead and the uh flint or chert arrowhead uh, I'm not sure exactly the stone composition, but it's a really good stone that they used. It was very sharp, uh, although they didn't do very well. We just saw they shattered on the armor and left nothing more than a, a scratch on it. So let's go ahead. We're going to try this spear. I assume an early man, or even a tribal man, if he had attacked this armor from a distance with a bow, uh, this is quite sharp too. It's a nice, heavy piece of wood. Uh, it's attached with sinew and actual tar. Uh, much like early man would do, but I think they would try throwing a spear because we know that spears that are thrown have as much power, they got a good heft and weight to them like this, or if not more penetrative power on metal, uh, than trying to push it through because that's just not going to do the same thing if you're sitting here trying to push it through. We're going to throw it. It's a lot like the overarm throwing uh, thrust or uh, slide that I do, uh, which might try a later century, of course. They'd be looking forward to that. We're going to try throwing it into the breastplate and see what this one does. Throw it as hard as I can. Maybe it'll do something. The obsidian right here, uh, instead of throwing at the target, which I threw off, I normally don't do that, but I haven't been warming up lately, I glanced at our target and it stuck in one of our uh, wooden throwing targets behind and broke off. So that points no more. I can't test it on the actual armor itself. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, it was kind of a, a fluke. Decided just to show you that I missed and broke it, and we don't have one to go with. We do have the obsidian. The only thing I'm going to do is a lot of people always argue and tell me I need to wear some kind of protection, especially if I'm dealing with something that could get in my eyes. And I'm sorry, I don't want volcanic glass in the eyes. So you're going to put these uh, Oakleys on. Uh, I know this might look a little crazy. Uh, it's kind of like Joe Cool uh, Trend, y'all. But uh, let's go ahead and see what happens. I'm going to see if I can put this through there. I'm going to use my overarm throwing slide technique, but it's just as a throw, a throwing thrust technique. Because we know that they threw a lot of spears early period, so they would have known to use that kind of energy behind it. So if he was trying to give it everything he got, and he only had that one opportunity to try to hit the guy in that spot. Now, I'm not saying that's the best thing. I think you should aim for any gaps, niches, anything like that. I think even early man would be smart enough to know this. But what I'm gonna do is I might have my hide shield and on its frame and I run up there and I'm gonna to try to give it a good thrust just straight into the body and see what happens. So let's, let's go ahead and try this out. in the eyes and I put lots of force in that but we got that same problem it chips it breaks and it hits again and we've got a dent in the dough but uh, that dent is way in front of the body so nothing really got transferred into the 
target itself. It's kind of a crunch zone, like kind of like modern cars eat up energy because they crunch down instead of stay solid and the person gets jostled around on the inside without a seatbelt killed. What ends up happening with the Iron Mountain Armory, uh, it's very solid steel. It's slightly hardened because it's a coal roll steel. It's harder than just regular mild steel or something. Uh, and then it's hammered out in shape, which gives it even more uh, strength. And then you have these double bands. So what ended up happening is uh, it crunched a little bit to eat the energy up, so he probably didn't feel anything. Uh, and it shattered our obsidian head. Uh, pretty much like our heads shattered on the arrows, and just like our heads, uh, our other air, uh, our other uh, flint or chert head, flint napped head, uh, broke in our uh, broken our wooden stump over here when it glanced off the uh, target. So anyway, I hope you all have enjoyed our episode today. Uh, I think that the Iron Mountain Army has survived the Neolithic era and the early primitive tribal cultures uh, if they weren't using more modernized weaponry. Survived quite well, unless you were going for niches. That's my disclaimer here. The person could still be a warrior from any of those time periods. Uh, early Neolithic era, uh, Native American, uh, Islander, like the Maori. Any of these, these uh, cultures could have injured, warrior cultures could have injured him if they hit the right areas but not through the armor itself. Uh, even the uh, shillelagh, as hard as it hit, gave him a good thump on the head, might have dazed him or stunned him, you might have been able to take advantage of him, maybe, but it's hard to tell because we don't even think it impacted the actual head. After a closer examination, uh, the actual little smudge mark or whatever on the thing that looked like a little damage to the flesh itself on top of the head was already there. It was there when we put the chamagi on, uh, the chamagi and the uh, uh, hachamaki. We put that over it. So, pretty much, uh, he's done well today. Uh, our next stop will be the Bronze Age and the Iron Age. So, we'll be looking at uh, warriors like Achilles possibly fighting against our samurai and the Spartan. So, we're going to have bronze and iron, and I guarantee you the spears will be a lot more damaging. These are shattered when you just thrust and they break and double tap pretty much. <laughs> anyway, hope you all have enjoyed our episode. Be looking forward to the next episode. And as always, Farvel. As you can see, this is where the spear actually hit and just got destroyed. And we're going to have to be careful for shards for the next few days. This is the one that decided that it didn't like the armor as much. It's quite heavily buried in here. And it has a little buddy of a black bumblebee over here. A black bee. As you can see, it's going to be lodged in there for a little while.